So good afternoon and welcome to Simon Fraser University in British Columbia in, in Canada. Um, my name is Peter Keller and I'm a professor of geography here at Simon Fraser University. This is Geography 327, the geography of tourism. And this is our last class, and we have kept the best until last. And it is my great privilege and honor to introduce you to Professor Richard Butler. And not that I want to give my, my age away, uh, but I will um, share with you and officially thank him for welcoming me to Canada back in 1980 when uh, I applied to do graduate studies. So I was privileged to be his, one of his uh, master's students. But I kind of feel like I'm, I'm just a number on a very, very, very long CV, because actually I think he has uh, graduated over 100 masters and PhD students in his career. Um, yeah, not only that, uh, he has written well over 100 papers. Some of them I think you have come across. And uh, not only that, but I think he has um, published, and it's really hard to keep track, but I think at the moment he's published 24 uh, books on tourism. But I know uh, at his young age, he's got the two or three or four more somewhere in the, in the pipeline. So the word retirement doesn't really exist for him. He, uh, he now holds the position of Emeritus Professor of Tourism at the University of Strathclyde in, in Glasgow. Um, you will tell from his accent that uh, he's not an not a Ontario Canadian or, or whatever. Um, but he, um, well, he did his undergraduate degree at Nottingham and then his PhD in, in Glasgow, in Scotland, moved to, uh, to London, Ontario, um, where he spent 30 years at the, the, the University of Western, then known as the University of Western Ontario, yep. so we better get that right. Um, um, and then um, he left Western and moved to the University of Surrey, where he became deputy head of research at the School of Management. And uh, his, his interests in tourism are, are far-flung and, and diverse. Um, he has published on tourism destination development, uh, tourism in remote areas, seasonality, sustainability. He, uh, he even has published on areas of GIS and, 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 and tourism and, and imagery and, 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 and tourism. Um, he's founding member and president or former president of the International Academy for the Study of Tourism and the past president of the Canadian Association for, for Leisure Studies. He has been a consultant for, for governments uh, in, in the UK and Canada and Australia. He's editorial on the editorial board of several tourism journals. And in 2015, he was awarded the United Nations World Tourism Organization's Ulysses Prize. So just amazing, what a, what a career. You will have come across him uh, when we introduced you to the, uh, the tourism area life cycle model. So here is the brain behind the tourism area life cycle model. And that is going to be his first presentation. So uh, I'm going to hand him over to you. Okay. Please welcome him. Thank you, Peter. It's, uh, it's a delight to be in front of a geography crowd because I left geography and no, you never leave geography, it's like old soldiers, but I left geography department in 1997 and I've rarely been in a geography department and given a lecture to geography people since then. And the last live lecture, as it were, was about four and a half years ago in Bali. Uh, so it's a treat to be back in a regular classroom in a regular university and doing what I used to do years ago. So, um, the talc makes it easier calling it the talc. Um, what is it? Well, it's a model. There are various things you have to remember when you deal with models because over the last 50 years or so, we've become much more accustomed to dealing with models than we ever were before. But it's all it is is a simplified version of reality. It isn't reality. It can never be because trying to model reality is you know, pointless. So you cut it down, you use it as a model, we have to remember it. And I'm just editing another book. And one of the authors in that made this quote about, about a model they were using and saying, you know, it actually reflects a complex reality that simple models are never going to be able to predict. And, you know, we have to, I think, remember that when you deal with any model. 
the idea of the talc was really quite, thinking about it now, you know, was quite arrogant and conceited of me as a junior assistant professor coming up with a model saying this is how tourism destinations evolve, period. You know, I've, I've solved it, here it is, you know. You can do that when you're conceited enough and young enough and whatever, you know. In the olden days you could do that, now of course you'd be held off the stage and you'd never get near a journal, but that's another story. Um, so it came about because I went into tourism back in 1964 and that was a great time, I think any time is a great time to start in tourism, but 64 was right at the cusp of a lot of really big significant changes and one of the changes was that resorts, destinations, whatever you want to call them, were going through real upheavals. It's hard to imagine now that we don't look at destinations as dynamic, but we didn't. They were places that had been built as holiday resorts 50, 60 years before, and they were always there, and that's where you went for your holidays. And the shock of the end of the Second World War, all the things that that induced, aircraft, budget changes, financial changes, credit cards, whatever, it just blew that model of the established, defined, permanent resort out of the window. And looking at tourism at that time, it seemed to me that there were a couple of things that fell into place with it. I'd been doing, reading quite a bit of stuff on just purely out of interest, on wildlife populations and the way they fluctuate up and down in the wild depending on food, food supply, predators and whatever. And the other thing was looking at the product life cycle, um, you know, putting out a product, marketing it, watching the sales go up and eventually plateau and then if you don't do something they start falling so you bring out a new model and so forth. You know, the Volkswagen bug car is the classic case. It came out when in the 1940s originally and you know it kept going and you put new headlights on it, you changed the motor but you still kept it at the back, you know, you slightly different body, different parts in it and so on and you kept it ticking along at a, at a level for a long long time, much longer than most cars have as a lifespan by good management, good design, good promotion. So I sort of put the two together and thought, well, you know, this should be happening now to destinations. So the whole point of the talk was to describe what I thought was a common process that was happening to many resorts or destinations. Um, and then it sort of evolved into, well, where is any particular destination at a particular point in time? Uh, is it in the development phase, is it in the stagnation phase or so on. And then it was picked up. It, it's interesting in a way because when I first presented the paper before it was published, I presented it in Victoria, the Canadian Association of Geographers, in 1980. And one of the questions afterwards from a guy called Bob Chadwick who is at Stats Canada was, could you use it for prediction? And, you know, in all naivety, I said, yeah, probably, you know, without really thinking what that implied. But it wasn't until probably about 15, 18 years later that people actually did play around with it to see if you could use it in a predictive manner. So it was something I hadn't anticipated and, and built into it, but I guess it was, a, in a sense, a logical follow-up to the basic model. So, you know, it looked like this. Um, the only real novelty about it, I guess, was putting stages into it, you know, it, because if you plotted the visitor arrivals or overnights or whatever for destinations, they tended to follow that curve. That wasn't that surprising. But, you know, I stuck my neck out and said, okay, well, it falls into stages, you know, uh, and these are names for them, but I literally you know, pulled out and stuck on it. And, you know, it got an interesting reception because when you get into publishing, academic publishing, 
it's a bit like, you know, if you write a thesis, so I was given some advice by a friend that said, if you ever want people to read your thesis, take the copy, put it in a bookshelf in your house and put it upside down. And then people will come along and go, oh, look at that, it's upside down, what is it? Oh, it's your thesis, you know. And that's about the only time anybody will look at it. Your mother will read it, uh, and the examiners will read it, and that's the end of it, you know. So your life's work, your opus, your PhD thesis is done. Got the union card, put it on the, put it on the shelf. And the same with articles. Um, I wrote to one US academic and asked him if he would do a chapter for a book of editing based on his article. And that's always risky because people don't always want to do book chapters and whatever. And he came out and he said, I'm amazed you read the article. I didn't know anybody had ever read it. I've never had anybody say they've read it and I've never had any feedback. So I'd love to write a chapter <laughs> based on the article. And the more you talk to people, you realise most articles that you get out and publish just sort of, you know, disappear. They're in the journal, you've got them on your CV and that's it. And almost nobody reads them. Now, of course, now we get the kudos report, the LinkedIn reports, everything else. And, you know, you've had 47 downloads today and, and so on and so forth. But you never did, even back in 1980. So it was a surprise. It still is a surprise that it's still quoted. Um, I probably get two notes a week, you know, that it's been cited somewhere steadily, which is quite absurd, really, you know. Um, so I'm grateful, you know, but you walk around in a constant state of, wow, you know, really? Uh, anyway, so you know roughly what the model is. So not much point in talking about it per se, but we're 42 years on from when it appeared in its final published form. So what's important about it now? You know, why is it maybe still relevant now? Well, to me there were several elements in it. I do tend to like. I was partly trained as a historian, so you periodise things, you know, they fall nicely into categories or so on. So the six things I'll talk about a bit. You can see I mean, dynamism, process, carrying capacity, management, spatial aspects, and triggers. Um, as I said earlier, you know, it was a surprise to many people, and I think a surprise to many people managing destinations, that things were changing. You know, I, I was born in Birmingham, which is the middle of England, as far away from the sea and any holiday resort as you can get in Britain. Um, and as a kid, I got taken to various holiday resorts. I never got to Blackpool or Brighton, the two sort of pivotal, typically British holiday resorts, um, but several of the others. And it was the same model, appearance, morphology in each one. And the pattern of visitation was the same. The markets were the same. People tended to go by railway to get there. Cars were only coming in post-war Britain in the 50s. Um, and they just carried on as they were. And then bang, you've got all sorts of economic upsets, you've got aircraft particularly, and suddenly, you know, people in Britain, other parts of Northern Europe, realised you didn't have to go to a rather cool, probably wet coast to paddle about in a cold sea. You could hop on a plane, fly down to the Mediterranean, well, it's about as far as you fly in those days, uh, and have a week or two weeks guaranteed sunshine, cheap wine, much cheaper accommodation and food than in Britain. You know, hey, you know, why the hell should we go to Brighton or Blackpool or Skegness when we can go to Mallorca uh, or somewhere in Provence or Spain or whatever? And things were never the same again. And the same thing happened other countries in Northern Europe up in North America. Why go to Atlantic City when you can go to Florida or whatever? So there was big change. And if you looked physically at the destinations, there was massive physical change that overtook many of them. Um, some, the lucky ones, as it were, went into overuse. Others went into obsolescence and were just 
useless. Some major elements disappeared. They went into retirement or commuter places and the hotels disappeared or were reused. You got differences in investment, you got renovation, you got replacement, or in some places you got disaster. But it was a time of fundamental change and it is now. I mean, okay, we've got COVID, you know, which is somewhat different to regular change, but it's had change. Change itself is important to look at in tourism. Um, you know, we have certain preconcepts. If I say to you, you know, this destination is changing, you'll probably think what it means. It's probably growing because for 50, 60 more years, tourism has been dominated by growth. That's what it's for. Development, growth, more. We don't think of the changes as being easily reversible. You don't pull down many hotels unless you're building a new one in its place. Um, the change often creeps up on places, just another hotel, you know, just another small resort on the side, another of this and so on. A lot of it overall is unintended because for many years, many resorts, and a lot still are, they may have development plans, but they don't operationalize them very and implement them very effectively. So change happens gradually, and quite often it's unanticipated, not just COVID. Um, but all of a sudden you've got a tipping point, you've reached a point at which it's no longer what it was, it's something really different and changed. So the study of change itself is perhaps the most important thing to look at in tourism. We are fortunate, those of us that study tourism, that, you know, change is a constant in tourism. It gives us something really interesting to look at. And destinations, whatever you call them, resorts, tourist areas, whatever, are really typical of that. And the change come, tends to come about in two ways. I mean, it's not either or, it's a bit of both, some it's more one than the other. But, you know, the evolutionary trend, which is what the talk is about, um, so to some extent you can predict it and it's gradual and it builds on what's gone before and you can see where it's going. It's, it's sort of more of the same. Um, and the changes that come about are mostly endogenous. They're self-inspired or self-generated. And then you've got the whiz back, you know, the revolutionary COVID as a negative, maybe, maybe positive in some respects, but a sudden change variable, unpredictive, often destroying, and the kind of thing that entrepreneurs do, you know, blow something up and build something new. So in tourism, when you look at that, this is a model that Dave Weaver um, and Martin, the late Martin Opperman came up with in their book on tourism management. Not with, they didn't have the uh, stuff in the blue boxes, they had other stuff, but the idea that some change is intentional and designed, and other are accidental and unintentional, and some is internal and some is external. So that, you know, external, intentional are things like budget airlines, low cost airlines. They come into a destination intending to change it, intending to change the market, enlarge it, and so on. Um, and at the internal level, you maybe enlarge the airport to meet that increased demand of planes or you've renovated something else. And then you get the unintentional unknown stuff. Uh, COVID is the classic example of something coming out of the blue causing major change. Unintentional, you know, COVID isn't the real thing in that sense of doing something. Um, and external to the place. And then you've got internal things which are not intended to affect tourism but do. Political change which may be brought about not by nothing to do with tourism per se but actually means a change in tourism management, tourism marketing and whatever. So it's to me it's one of the most important parts of tourism and one of the most important parts of the model uh, that makes it interesting. 
Now the process I've talked about, I won't spend more than a minute or two on that. The, it was just based on the assumption there's a consistent and replicated pattern of development that's common. Um, what brings it about in terms of the detailed forces vary from place to place. The time scale varies very much from place to place. In some cases, they've gone through the whole life cycle in two decades. In others, it's a hundred years. So, you know, there's immense variety within it. But generally, the pattern is similar. And if you look at the morphology, the physical pattern of many well-established destinations, um, they're really similar. Look at the paper, the Recreation Business District, um, which was in the Journal of Leisure Research in 1972. Um, and it lays out brilliantly the way traditional holiday resorts were developed. Jeff Wall, who's a good friend and colleague, and I were visiting Manly, which is a suburb of Sydney. Um, you sail out from Sydney round to the coast. And we walked down the main, got off the ferry at the pier, and we walked down the main street and we said, God almighty, this is the same as Brighton. And Jeff said, no, it's the same as Cape Ness. And I said, no, it's the same. It was exactly the same, the same layout from the ferry to the beach, the same sort of shops where the hotels were, everything. They had just followed a common physical morphology as well as a temporal um, morphology, if you like. Now the, if you like, the heart of the tower was the idea that if we didn't manage it effectively, any destination would, if it was successful, would end up overdeveloped. We weren't using the term over tourism then, um, but that stuff would get away from the destination. It would simply grow. Nobody would be checking it. Nobody would be arranging appropriate facilities to meet the excessive demand. It would become overused, deteriorate in quality, um, and therefore deteriorate in market attract attractivity or attractiveness. If you look up attractivity, it doesn't exist according to the dictionary, so attractiveness, but appeal. And so if you had a place that was worn out, overused, tacky, no redevelopment, no clear management plan, people would find other places to go to and it would go into decline. Now the subtitle or the back end of the title of the original article was manage implications for management of resources. And a lot of people, when they read the tower, I don't think they read the second half of the title. You know, they look on it, and it's a model about the, the way destinations develop. You know, they go up and down, and that's it. It wasn't really about that. It was saying, this is what is likely to happen if we don't manage them properly. But that sort of seemed to slip away a bit. Um, so I talked about the sort of spiral of decline that it grew, didn't manage properly, didn't reinvest, didn't redevelop, and you would go into decline. So management, you know, led from that. Uh, as I say it was underplayed in the way many people have looked at the model and used it. They've concentrated on the development pattern and process and not why. You know, as a geographer, I got a, gave a talk to high school teachers in Ontario years ago, and they gave me a t-shirt, well not a t-shirt, a sweatshirt, which I would have worn today, but I can't get into it anymore. Um, but it had geography, why, what, is where. And I thought, okay, as a historian, part of historian, you should have added when. But, you know, why, what, is where. I mean, that's really what, not the physical geographers, my son did physical geography, but we still talk. But, you know, <laughs> human geographers, that's what we do. Why is this there? I mean, even physical geographers will begrudgingly admit they sometimes look at why a glacier is there and what it, what it does. Um, you know, why is it there? How is it operated? What effect does it have? And that's equally true for tourist destinations. Why are they there? There as opposed to there. What is being done? What is being managed? What is being offered? So, I guess one of my career moans, complaints, which like for most academics falls on deaf ears, 
is that we don't manage tourism. I mean, there were masses of courses. I taught a course entitled Tourism Management, but we don't manage tourism. You know, we plan it. We rarely implement the plans. The tourism plans, you know, fill this building that have never been implemented. Um, destination management organisations don't manage, they promote. There's hardly any of them that actually deal with management. They're really good at promoting. You know, so you know, our visitor numbers went up 4% last year, that's great. You know, next year we're predicting 5% and so on. That's not management, as I understand it, management of the destination. That's why something like Disney, to me, is successful. Because Disney manages. Um, having had a couple of tours around Disney World and Epcot, you may or may not like Disney and what it offers and what it implies. But my God, the management is efficient. And they know what they're doing and they plan and they've got it. And if the haunted house isn't selling at this rate, boom, down goes the haunted house, in comes Star Wars, you know. And so on, they've got no compunction. It's managed for a purpose, which is profit for Disney, and it's managed. The crowds are managed, the, you know, the, the zigzag lines were first instituted there in tourist places. You know, it's managed and it's successful, whether we like it or not, and whether it's a model we want to follow. But that's the good example of what management can do to stop you from falling into decline and becoming outdated. Now, one of the important aspects was spatial in the original model. The, the first version of the model came out in 1972 and it was concerned with the idea that as places became redundant, new places would set up and they would set up in similar situations um, as close to but separate from the original site. And so, you know, if you look at a gross scale at the Mediterranean, You've got the start of tourism in France and Italy, and then it spreads down the Italian coast into Spain, and then Portugal, then Greece, then Turkey, then Egypt and Tunisia, and you know, it goes around, not in necessarily a small, uh, you know, a regular coordinated pattern, but it does that. If you look at the Caribbean islands, they follow the same pattern from development in Cuba, and then Jamaica and Barbados. And you know, they, they jump as one becomes established, another one sees a new niche to open up and develop. So that's tended to, it didn't appear much in the original model, but it, it was the geographical implications of it. Um, triggers were not mentioned in the model. I mean, it's, it's only seven and a half, eight pages long. There isn't a statistic in it. There isn't an equation in it. You wouldn't get a look in at any journal you could name today for all of those reasons. You know, it might be a research note tucked away somewhere. Um, but what is, I think, interesting to look at now, I mean, we know the pattern roughly works and it works in a number of places and so on, is why? What triggers the change? So if, if you take my argument that the, the important things are the dynamism, the change, the logical thing is, well, what is driving it? What causes a place to boom or bust or change its focus? Um, it can be entrepreneurs. People, I mean, the Gold Coast in Australia was kick-started by one guy. Um, if you look at all the other edited a book with Ross Russell in Melbourne on giants of tourism and we looked at people like Hilton and Disney, Richard Branson, Banneker who came up with the first commercial tourist guide of whatever um, and what they did to kickstart either what they were doing or where they were working or what they saw. Now if, how many of you have been to Scotland? Okay two right well, the rest of you that haven't been, you probably have an image of Scotland. And it probably, you know, if you shut your eyes and think, it's probably what? Mountains, lakes, castles, 
men in skirts in a tartan pattern, whiskey, uh, sort of kilted Highlander, whatever. Now, you may add golf and other stuff afterwards, but you know, that essential image of Highland scenery, tartan, whatever, was totally created over about a 10 year period by one man, by a writer, Sir Walter Scott. Before then, the only people that visited Scotland were English soldiers, because it had been in rebellion in 1745, um, or the odd scientist. And yet in 1822, the German king from England visited Scotland for a big pageant organised by Sir Walter Scott. And it changed the whole image of Scotland. He wasn't an entrepreneur, he was an author. But the book sold at a scale I don't think we've ever seen since. Maybe J.K. Rowling is the only one since who's had that effect on a whole generation of, wow, you know, Harry Potter mania. Um, Queen Victoria bought a holiday home there, which the royal family still use and so on. One person can be a trigger to a whole small country's image changing to a destination changing. And then other things as well that are triggers, you know, if you look at transport, what's happened to transport to destinations, um, every piece of transport we've invented over time has been used to get to a tourist place or as a form of recreation. You know, electric scooters are the, and electric bikes are the last fad, perhaps. Snowmobiles, which I researched when I was at Western, you know, was, was the classic example of somebody invents a utility vehicle to go out over snow to rescue people and take ambulance care because one body, his son, was, in, was ill and died because they couldn't get him to hospital. So he came up with a snowmobile. You know, and then it went wild. Everybody's taken it, converted it to recreation use and all sorts of problems that we've seen coming up with driverless cars and so on, liability, safety, insurance, whatever. You know, in the 80s, you could just get on a snowmobile and go anywhere. No insurance, no license, no laws of trespass that could effectively be applied against you. It was a free fall. Um, so we, transport is a tremendous agent of change for destinations. It makes them or breaks them. I've just finished a paper we've been looking at um, the vulnerability or safety of islands from over tourism and the key thing in every case is transport if you can control the transport you can control tourism and you know New Zealand showed this if you shut the transport down you could for a while stop COVID you know they until the last couple of months they were COVID virtually, totally COVID free, um, at a cost, no tourism, uh, quite often no domestic tourism and so on. But, you know, transport, we tend to know, but not in passing, but, you know, low cost airlines revolutionize European tourism, go for a stag weekend to Dublin or to Prague or somewhere else, places people had never thought about going to for a weekend, you know. You, know, you get to Australia from England in 24 hours or less, you know, and people, not for a weekend, but people were going to New York to shop for a weekend in London. Um, you know, that we, we sort of take that for granted, but it, it's a really powerful thing. This chapter that Zimmerman came up with, I think, deserves far, far more attention than it's ever got. It was in a book called Pacific Rim Tourism and what he showed was quite fascinating. He argued the case for life cycles for activities. You know that uh, an activity would have a life cycle peak and then people would get fed up with it and it would decline in importance. More importantly from my perspective were these which is the break, in his case, through two world wars. You know, tourism stops. Well, it doesn't, actually. The Swiss made 
good money out of the Second World War, and laid the foundation for their current tourism industry. But generally, wherever there's war, tourism more or less stops. Once war is finished, war is a great boost for tourism. You know, go to Europe, what do you see? Castles, battlefields, monuments, you know, the other things outside the major cities that people go to see. Trenches from the First World War, um, concentration camps at Auschwitz, you know, the horrors, dark tourism, perhaps. No, it's not always dark that people are going for. Some of it's curiosity, some of it's family relations, some of it's acts of heroism and whatever. Going to visit the site of the 300 Thermopylae, um, the Spartans against the Persians, sort of in admiration and whatever. But, you know, what does it do? in the life cycle to have a break and you know he suggested that it simply carries you know drops of it and then it carries on um, we haven't really ever looked at that in any detail and it, you know all the stuff that's coming out on covid now is potentially giving us a great opportunity to do that covid stopped the clock i mean stopped it like it's never been stopped before we had Spanish flu, which was worse than COVID, but contained because we didn't have air travel to anything like the degree we had. And you know, if you got Spanish flu, you were dead within 24 hours, most places. So it didn't spread the way COVID had spread. But you know, so we don't have anything to model this on. But if you have a break, no tourism for two years, what does it mean? How many places survive? How many hotels or other places go bankrupt? Are they replaced? Uh, you know, what happens? We don't know. And so the break, the gap, is going to be fascinating to find out what happens to the cycle afterwards. Um, so, you know, it's important to look at that. Now, um, this isn't really a plug for Peter. Um, one of the interesting things that, that he wrote about um, the graphics were pretty bad in 1980s, weren't they, in journals. Um, but that as you change stage, you get periods of instability and things are out of control. Different investments, different governments being involved, uh, all sorts of things that make it difficult to, to deal with and to predict what will happen as you move from one. It's, it's chaos, the butterfly effect and whatever. So again, change and why what are the triggers what are the implications so you know um it's it, like any model it's got limitations um it's hard to define the stage because not all the indications of when you're in a particular stage coincide so you may be peaked in hotel visitation rates and numbers but Airbnb is going crazy and still booming. So not all the components will be in sync. So maybe, it's, I shouldn't have put stages, I should have put it as a continuum. But anyway, what the hell. Um, you know, but it's hard to define the stage specifically. Um, visitor numbers that I used up the vertical side of the graph. That was purely because they were the only thing available. I mean, trying to get accurate visitor numbers um, or another measure, investment, beds, whatever, it's much harder than getting visitor numbers. Now, visitor numbers, of course, are not the answer or really the measure of tourism development. Um, you know, if, if out of a million, half a million are cruise passengers, that's very different to a city that's got 800,000 visitors who all stay overnight. So visitor numbers are dodgy uh, to measure. Carrying capacity varies. I mean, I was naive in the early stages thinking carrying capacity was set, but of course it isn't. And it varies at different stages. How many people you can accommodate before it's too many and what you can do to adjust it. So there's a dynamic element there. Um, and lastly, you know, different products that you're selling at a destination will have different, according to Zimmerman, different life stages themselves. So it's, 
That's what I said at the beginning about the model being a drastic simplification of reality. It's, it's far, far more complicated than that. So, I talked about two as an area in the title, I never defined it. You know, I wouldn't get away with that now. Um, you know, did I mean a resort? Did I mean a community that had gone into tourism? Did I mean somewhere like Cancun that had been built from scratch? What is, you know, what, what is a tourist area? Is it Whistler? Or is it, you know, from Whistler down the highway to Vancouver? Or what, you know? So we need to define it. And some of the early criticism was saying, you know, you can't apply it. It doesn't work for the Pacific. Well, I didn't think it would. But it might work for Fiji or Samoa or New Zealand or, or whatever, you know. So that's a problem. Um, so you do have to simplify it. Um, and it's had valid, then I, at the odd time I think invalid or unfair criticism. But that's, you know, that's life. The fact that people are still writing about it 40 years after is, is weird. Um, but any model you produce, anything, should be capable of being modified. I've had different, Dave Weaver suggested a different beginning in places that had had plantation economies Others have suggested the it's a scalloped pattern. Bob Merch, Bob McCurcher's last article in is it tourism management, you know, current issues, I think, you know, suggested there were six life cycles, six patterns of life cycles. Um, if you want something funny to read, which is I think enlightening about academia, read the little paper at the bottom there by Wang. It's only about four pages long. And Dave Weaver, who used to be one of my PhD students, sent it to me and said, I hope you're not offended. And I read it and just thought it was hilarious because what they did was they analysed a whole bunch of papers that had cited the life cycle and they concluded, I think it was 20, 22% they decided and never read it, you know, that had cited it. And some other percentage had miscited it you know, or misinterpreted it, and, you know, it's a, it's a hilarious and embarrassing commentary on academic writing, you know. So don't believe everything you read, and don't believe everything that people write down and say, you know, they've done. Um, so, you know, they had a typology of cited motivations, you know, why had they used it? Some clearly just to you know, add another reference into the, the thing. Others because they had actually used it and, and so on. So it's a, it's a salutary expression thing to read um, that and, and see what happens when academics play around with other academics work. So that's enough on that. I'm happy to shoot questions or whatever. If any of you are still interested afterwards, you've got the email there. Peter's got the, the slides. So if you want to email me anything, I'll be delighted. I've been Rupert, it's good to get emails in the wilderness. And uh, I'll try and answer it if you've got any, any questions. Otherwise, I'll quit talking for now. So. Right, here's your chance. Any <laughs> questions? Thoughts? Comments? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, First of all, thank you for coming in and giving this presentation on the topic. It's funny because at the beginning of this class, we were introduced to it by a professor, and it was like, oh, okay, this is a model. And now you're standing in front of us here. It's like, oh, hi, how's it going, right? Um, so in your presentation you uh, about the TELF, you explain about locations such as England and Scotland and Australia. But I was wondering, over the course of your career, have you ever come across a destination that sort of bucked the trend and just could not the TELP could not be applied to this destination at all whatsoever. Oh yeah, and it, I lose sleep at night. No, I don't. But <laughs> yes, no. Anybody got an idea what it might be? Las Vegas. It's in the wrong place. It's as unsustainable as you can get. It's artificial. It's got a you know sinful reputation, which is maybe part of the attraction. You know, but why? It shouldn't be doing it. Now, it shouldn't be the success it still is. You know, it's had up and down, but it, it's still going up. And I'm, I'm doing a 
final book on the Tao and try to find somebody who would do a chapter on Vegas and say, this is why Tao doesn't work everywhere. And I can't find anybody. Um, you know, anybody, anybody willing to write it? <laughs> you know, written enough on Vegas to be able to say why. I mean, I could suggest why. I think one is that the town itself has an attitude that, you know, we are different, we are Vegas, we survive, we grow. Now, I'm sure there are people in Vegas who don't subscribe to that, but the overall impression is that, you know, it likes what it does and it's successful at it and it does more of the same. And it doesn't stand still. Now, part of its advantage, I guess, if, if that's the right word, is that it's not faced with the fact you can't pull down the pier because it was built in 1850 or you can't pull down that hotel, you know, Sands Hotel, which was the classic, you know, original Sinatra Mafia Connection hotel. Boom, you know, down it goes and a new hotel goes up. And I'll do that about anything at any time. Um, Ocean, which, which was the you know, Ocean's 13, you know, the new, the, the third one with the new hotel. You know, that's Vegas, you know, if it'll make a buck, we'll try it. And it's, I think it's just a different atmosphere. Why it's at Vegas, whether it's Vegas' history, whether it's municipal attitude and spirit, I don't know. But, you know, quick short answer, yes, Vegas. Other places, probably. Uh, I mean, it, there's no reason why that should work everywhere. Um, and there are variations on it that, it, you know, it, it hasn't gone like that, it's gone like that. Sheila Agarwal argued that there was a sort of post-Fordist slump. It got rid of various things and then took off again in other places and so on. And I'm sure there are other places. And some places haven't been going long enough to find out. Um, others still have tourist numbers coming, but the ethos of the town and that have, have changed. But the one that just blows it is Vegas. Um, you know. So if you've got any thoughts, any ideas, let me know. <laughs> I'd like to have something on Vegas and say why, you know, what, what is it that makes this place different? Is it the only place that's as different as this? I hear a master's thesis or a PhD.